Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is color artist Alex Sinclair. Alex, welcome to Comic Culture. Hi, thank you for having me. Now, Alex, you are a, a color artist of, uh, of, well, a great reputation. You've worked on a lot of really high profile books in your career. And you were uh, getting your start, I think, in the industry when it was moving over from traditional uh, you know, hand coloring to digital coloring. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that time uh, and, and how you sort of got started. Right around uh, when I was graduating from college, uh, I, I was getting an art degree from UCSD. I, I had uh, decided to, to kind of change my portfolio and, and go after a, a, a career in comics or at least a job in comics. And I think like every other colorist and inker, we all start off aspiring to be pencilers. So we create pencil ink and, and, and samples and we show them around at the conventions to editors and other artists. And I think uh, most of my conversations were critiques on my pencils, critiques on my inks and, and hey, but I really like your colors. Uh, and so um, when uh, Jim Lee and, and the rest of the guys broke off and created Image Comics, they all had their own studios and then and, and, and Jim in one of the issues of Wildcats put a, a talent search in the back of, of, of the issues and, and I decided to answer that and I decided that I was just going to send my color work because that was what was my strongest skill at the time. Uh, and, and so I sent only color samples and at that time most of the books were still being colored by hand with guides and, and the color palette was a very limited palette and, and each color had a code so I had to learn how to code. And so the samples I sent in were, were geared for that kind of a job where I was I was coloring stuff and coding it. Uh, and so I sent my samples in within two, three weeks, Jim called. Um, and he, the first thing he said is like, hey, we got your samples, they're great, uh, but uh, we don't code anymore, everything's digital. <laughs> and so he has started to kind of ask me, the interview basically was like, hey, do you know what Photoshop is? And I, I had no idea what Photoshop was. It was 1993, and so Photoshop was version 2.0. Um, my Mac that I had at home was a little classic black and white <laughs> computer, but I had a program on it that kind of mirrored what Photoshop had done with a lasso tool and a brush tool and a pencil tool. When he heard that I knew what those tools were and how to use them, he was like, well, come in, we can try it out, see how things work out. We're, we really want to, to push everything digital. And, and uh, I was there, I came in, uh, did some tryout pieces with them, spent two weeks basically teaching myself Photoshop uh, while I was at the studio. Um, mock coloring stuff that, that they were having colored elsewhere. And then after two weeks, Jim, Jim asked me to, to stay. And, and from that, I started working with John Nee, who was then running the, the studio, on how to, all right, now how do we do it? How can we, yeah, you colored it, but now how do we get from here to film? And, and he, he owned a, a, a separation house at the time. And, and, and so we, John had a ton of, of, of the, the technical and the practical input where I was just coming in as an artist trying to see if it could work. And uh, there was a lot of head banging and screaming and yelling and pulling and <laughs> pushing, but it, it helped us create uh, a, a system that worked uh, and, and establish a studio that, that had some, some great colorists come out of it and work there. And, and, and obviously Joe Chida was probably at the head of a lot of that and that he was creating color guides that we were interpreting digitally. Uh, and so I think Joe was the, the, the highest influence, I think, there uh, artistically when it came to color. Image is one of those, uh, that's a turning point in comics. I mean, we, we see that those seven creators leave Marvel and they start their own studios, but they really do transform the medium as we know it today by bringing in uh, different paper and, and obviously the digital coloring. Um, and it, it's got to be exciting in a way. You're in sort of on that ground floor and you start to see uh, this is the way the industry is going. So there's a point where, where color work changes even uh, more, where now we see the colors are, are filling in a lot of the darker tones for inkers, and it just seems like there's almost a more cinematic look to a comic. So as you go from 1993, you know, just knowing that you have a brush tool and a pencil tool on your Mac, to you know, 2021, where Photoshop and, and Clip Studio Paint and, and Procreate, all of these great tools for you. How do you sort of interpret the pencil art or the ink art that you get and, and sort of turn it into, you know, those great pages that we see? Well, what was great about Photoshop and all these new programs that kind of started, I think these new programs pushed Photoshop into having to become more artist friendly. I, I think 
uh, from the offset, it was more of a photographer's program. Uh, but these other uh, companies that were creating a painting uh, application and programs pushed Photoshop into just continue to excel and, 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 and improve their product. And, and I think somewhere along the line, they, it stopped being a program and became a painting medium. Uh, and that it facilitated a lot of, of, of what we were used to using as artists with, with you know, actual paint, brush, whatever medium you're using to paper, uh, uh, we started to be able to mimic that digitally. And I think at a certain point it became a, a painting medium. And for all, a lot of us who trained traditionally as artists, it was great because then we, we didn't have to rely on, on maybe I'm going to paint this and scan it and then add it to whatever I'm doing, which I, I did early on and, and, and just went strictly straight into the computer. And that became my painting medium for comics. And so I think it, 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 it also allows for the manipulation of the, of the ink, which is something that when you're doing it on paper, you really have to paint over them literally and would have to trace the inks to, to change it. Where with digitally, it's so much easier to just grab them and, 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 and isolate them and, and do with them as you please. It allowed for uh, an extremely larger palette. So you went from 378 colors to millions of colors. Painting replication where, you know, you have gradations in every page of every panel, every character, where in the past everything was flat color. Uh, and again, the special effects is what really pushed it. And I think these guys from Image, that's kind of what, what they were going, right? What's the next evolution of comics is, well, we're competing with movies and video games. We got to make it look like that. And, 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 and that's that digital uh, coloring, I think, was one of the biggest jumps in the medium uh, in the last 20, 30 years. It's, it's fascinating, too, because you see artists like Kevin McGuire, who, you know, got his career started in the 1980s at DC. And his line work now is, is a lot lighter. There's a lot less shadowing. There's a lot less, you know, uh, spotted blacks in his work because he knows that the color artist, whether it's something that he's doing himself or something that he's, you know, handing over to somebody else, uh, they'll be filling that in. So as you're working uh, with, with artists today, are they giving you that room or are they giving you the, you know, the hard blacks and you have to sort of interpret that to the color palette that you create? I think you get a little bit of both depending on which artist you're working with. Uh, I think the really great artists are the ones that, that are the pencilers that are penciling, anticipating what the inker and the colors are going to do. I think that's when you get the really well-rounded piece where it's not just my pencils, it's, it's a I'm working with these two other artists and I'm going to do my best so that they can have a, a say in what the piece is going to look like in the end. It's that collaborative mentality that I think the really great artists have. There's credits on the cover of comics and I know in the 1980s when I started reading comics it would be the writer and the penciler and maybe the inker. But now we're starting to see that the whole team is getting credited on the cover. Uh, so, you know, there is certainly more uh, understanding of what a color artist is doing. And when I look at some of your work, there is, uh, there's a great range uh, between what you do on one book compared to what you do on the other. So when you're given an assignment, when you are asked for, uh, you know, an editor calls you and says they want you on their book, you know, how are you sort of approaching the, the look that you're going to give them based on, you know, I guess what information they give you and your own personal, you know, set of skills? Uh, I talk with the editor, I talk with the artist. What kind of approach uh, are we doing? What type of approach would you like to, to do in this book? Sometimes the script will dictate a lot of, of what the book's going to feel like. So when I'm doing a Harley Quinn book, and it's all about the, the craziness of not just the character, but all the, the supporting characters and the stories, and it's, everything's kind of about to go off the rail. So the, the palette kind of almost mirrors that, and it's, it's a very bright, explosive kind of palette. And then you move from that to uh, Batman's Grave, which is all about the mood, all about the, 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 the mystery of the story where you come in with muted palettes and then very limited palettes to, to help focus the mood, especially in, in, in a story like that. So a lot of those, sometimes the conversations are between the, the artist and myself, just to make sure that we're both on the same page or all three of us are on the same page. Uh, and then the other two, it's one of those things that, hey, I'm going to go with this approach, uh, if that's cool with you. And most of the time, the editors are very, very receptive to to what the discussions that we've already had as, as the artistic team. You talked about the, the mood, and I've seen your work on Harley Quinn, and that's a book that, you know, that character is, is larger than life, and there's a great deal of humor to that. Um, and it, it 
immediately strikes my mind as, as very much like the 1966 Batman TV show where, you know, it was a bright, colorful background and, you know, it was cool Dutch angles whenever we'd see the, the Riddler or Egghead or something like that. You know, are you tapping into that, that sort of, you know, that, uh, that sense of fun that a book like that might have had? Or are you tapping into an era when you're looking at a book? You're adjusting as the, the book goes on, but do you ever think to yourself, you know, this, is, this should capture that, that classic Marvel look of the 1970s or that classic Superman look from the, the film. Yeah, I do. I do kind of borrow from, from eras or movies. Uh, sometimes it's, oh, I really, I enjoy a movie so much that I'm like, I really loved how this cinematographer really handled the lighting and, and, and the, the color choices in, in that particular movie. And, and it just kind of, uh, when a, a book presents itself that share similarities with maybe that movie i'll bring that in i'll borrow that kind of those sensibilities to help enhance the book to help get that same feel that i got from the movie hopefully the readers when they as they're reading it they get that same thing like that great feeling that i got when i was watching the movie uh, another thing that i've noticed with these uh the, the the use of digital colors some color artists are adding things like lens effects like a lens flare or something like that to uh the page now i'm not sure if that's something that you do specifically but i'm just wondering you know uh from a, a the the standpoint of you know films having a certain technical way that they're created using lenses and lens flares occurring when the light hits that lens are you thinking that that might be something that you'd want to put into the comic because we're used to seeing things you know, especially with the you know the dc expanded universe or the marvel cinematic universe you know we're used to uh seeing stuff like that and why not put that into a comic sure i mean we want to make it look as, as as cool, as realistic as possible. Uh, and so a lot of those little lens effects or, or glows or explosions that you see from the special effects studios, all that kind of stuff is stuff that we soak in because we're going to try and you know, replicate it or use something similar down the line uh, to give them that same feel, uh, especially nowadays, right? When, when uh, we're seeing a lot of what a lot of us read when we were younger is actually on screen. And it's so cool to see, oh my God, they borrowed that from from that issue or that run of, of, of whatever the movie or the program is about. And so it's upon us to kind of establish that on paper form so that when it gets translated to the, to, to the movies or TV, uh, it, it's already kind of bridged for them. Also, very interesting when we see, um, uh, let's say, a character like Green Lantern, where, where now they sort of project um, you know, the Green Lantern symbol uh, floating over his chest. And I'm assuming that's something that the penciler is is uh, showing us, but the color artist is interpreting and, and putting their own spin on. Um, so as you start to get more into um, creating these cool effects and these great uh, tricks of, of digital technology, as well as an expanded palette going from, you know, a few colors to millions of colors, are they giving you more time to actually work on this or is it still the same sort of deadline of like, we needed that last week? It's like a blessing and a curse, right? <laughs> you, you can do more, but you, you either have the, about the same amount of time or less time to do it in. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's still a very deadline-driven job. And so uh, for the most part, uh, especially recently, I've, I've been able to have plenty of, of lead time. But I've, I've, uh, especially early on in, when the studio was, was still kind of getting going, we were, we were really, it was this, this kind of, uh, bail or sink mentality where it's like, oh, we got to get this book out this week. Otherwise, you know, we won't have a book out for the month of whatever. And we need that revenue. So it really became about like everybody killed themselves to make sure that the book got out because it meant that we could all still work <laughs> at the end of the month or the, or the week or whatever that happened to be. So um, uh, very early on, the, the amount of time that we spent at the studio was uh, quite a bit. We, we we uh, we had some, uh, you know, we had specific like furniture there that we could use uh, because of the amount of time that we spent at the studio. Uh, so it's gotten a lot much better. I mean, uh, working from home definitely makes a, a huge difference. So that as, as the computers, you know, became more affordable, it was easier for us to kind of break away and work from home and then establish our own uh, uh, schedules and all that stuff. Um, so it's it's gotten a lot better thanks to the technology, the accessibility of it for us. There's still, you know, depending on who you're working with, some, some folks give you the, the week and a half to two weeks that you probably want to color a book, and, and some folks, you know, turn in the last few pages the day before they're due, so, for me. So, it, you get, you get a, a little bit of both. You know, you, you mentioned that you work from home, and that 
is both a blessing and a curse sometimes because I'm sure your family is fully aware that when you're in your studio, that's your time at work, and unless the house is on fire, they shouldn't come and knock on the door. But um, it's also got to present problems because you are at home, and there are things going on, and, and maybe someone's going to give you a call in the afternoon because they think, oh, you're just, you're just at home. You can help me move that sofa. So how do you sort of balance all the stuff that happens at home with all the stuff that you're doing as your profession that just happens to be uh, in your studio at home? And it's hard. It, it really takes uh, being really good at scheduling yourself. So if I know that uh, I'm going to, uh, and, and especially when my daughters were all younger, it was like, if I'm going to go, you know, uh, on the field trip with, with Harley on Thursday and Blythe has her concert on Tuesday. I, I kind of work around it and anticipating those, those moments. So that's to make sure that I, that I do spend the time with them as well, because, there, there are weekends when I'm having, I have to work through the weekend, and then it's, it's not fair to them because to them that's their free time, and so it's a lot of, of, of discipline as far as like when I, when I'm sitting at my desk, I'm, I'm working and not necessarily, you know, surfing through the internet or, or wasting time on, on, on Instagram or whatever social media it is that, that, that people are on all the time, and so it, it's definitely a lot about that discipline and dedication, knowing that you're doing it to, to alleviate the time later on that you're gonna you're going to want to use to spend with your family or, or the trip or whatever it is that, that, that you want to be a part of. You say the word discipline, and I'm imagining with a career that, that goes back to the 1990s, you have a great professional discipline. So uh, if you have a deadline, you're probably not the type of person who's waiting until the night before to start a project. So uh, that allows you to schedule all that other stuff that's, that's going on. So if you're given a, a book and you're told that you have a week and a half to color it, uh, so how do you sort of divide the day so that way you can get everything done and, and make sure that you still have, you know, all of that other time? Are you kind of doing it like it takes me this long to do a page, so if I'm not done with this page by this time, I, I'm off schedule? Or is it something where you might just get into a rhythm and do more pages than you thought you were going to do? Yeah, I think it's more of I'm, I'm kind of have like, a, like so many pages should take me this amount of time. And so that if, if I have to do 20 pages by Friday, I can, you know, all right, if I can do four pages a day, that's five days, that should work. At four pages a day, I should be able to do two, two and a half hours per page. I kind of set myself these, like, small goals per page so that uh, if I'm not hitting them, I'm realizing that I'm, that, that means that I'm going to have that much less time per page down the line. So um, I do have, like, a little timer that I set. Like, so if I've decided it's going to be, like, a two and a half hours per page kind of a week, I set two and a half hours when I start the page. And then that, that tells me if, if I finish the page before the, the timer is out, then I've, I've bought myself that much amount of time for the next page and, and so on and so forth. And so it, the, it's a little more regimented as the deadline gets tighter. I, I, I didn't quite go as fast as I thought. So this week, you know, the dog doesn't get the walk on Wednesday because that, that's an hour that I need to be able to work. I, those little things kind of start to get compromised. That's interesting because you, you sort of build into your schedule. What I always tell my students is, you know, you don't plan on having a flat tire, but you always keep a spare in the trunk of your car. So it seems like you have, you know, it's bad for the dog that, you know, the dog doesn't get to go on a walk, but you do have that hour to, to kind of play with it if you are not quite done at two and a half hours on that page. So that way you can still kind of keep to that schedule. Another question is, you know, if you're working on a book that has one look and a book that has another look, are you just working until the one look is complete? Or do you kind of just jump back and forth because, you know, maybe you get bored with one look and you want to try, you know, something like a sorbet, so to speak, to, to kind of cleanse the palate and, and do something different? Uh, I, I change it mostly to um, adapt to the artist, one and two to the story. Uh, and so that's probably going to, what's going to determine what, what, route I'm going with the palettes and the, and the style. Most of the, the work that I'll do is, is just kind of linear. So I'll do Spider-Man issue whatever this week, and then next week it's, it's Batman whatever. Uh, there's been times when the deadlines have kind of intersected and the art's kind of coming in sporadically, so I, I will bounce between one and the next. It tends to be a little bit harder, especially if I'm changing palettes, uh, in that I have to kind of remind myself that it's you know, uh, when I was doing like Harley Quinn and Batman at the same time, it, it, those two palettes are really different. And so it's, it, it was, it, it's harder because you kind of get into a role and a mindset and, and you, you stop because you're running out of ink, you jump onto the next one and you start. And it's a little bit of a kind of like a, I have to restart the computer in my, in my brain so that I'm, I'm adapting to the, the, uh, 
the the nuances of the art and and the story and so um bouncing back and forth tends to uh, slow me down so that's why i prefer just kind of doing one issue entirely and then doing the next and you also just said that you might be working on spider-man which is a marvel character and batman which is a dc character so if you are working for two competing companies uh, during one month, is there pressure put on you from one uh, maybe saying, you know, we need you to do pay more attention to us than to our competitor? Or are they both like, well, you know what, if you want the best, you just got to take what the best is able to give you at that time? I think if, as long as I hit the deadline that they've given me, they don't care when or what I work on. Uh, so if they give me, if, you know, if the book's due tomorrow and I turn it in, then they don't care what I did leading up to that. And so as long as I can hit my deadline, I think that they're happy. Uh, which means that, that I can kind of bounce back and forth. And so, uh, you know, there's decisions that I have to make that uh, as I'm working along uh, on, the, on the interiors of, of one book for one company, you know, the deadline for a cover for a different company has coming up so that I have to jump off, do the cover to make sure that I hit that deadline and then come right back on so that I can continue and finish and turn on, turn in the, the, the other job for the other company. So um, it wasn't a problem for me for the longest time. I was exclusive to DC Comics for 22 years up until this last December. And so that's when uh, I decided not to sign up and find another exclusive with them and, and go full freelance. And that's, I've only been doing Marvel work for four months or and actually work for other companies, to be honest, uh, for, the, for the last four months. And that's that's got to be um, both liberating and maybe... I'm sure the decision wasn't an easy one to make uh, because there's always the, you know, you don't know where uh, as a freelancer where the next job is going to come from. But again, you know, 20 some odd years in the industry, they're pretty much going to be knocking on your door. So when you're making a decision like that, it's probably something that, that weighs on you. Um, so is this something, uh, obviously you're gonna probably talk to the family, make sure that they're all cool with that. Um, but are you talking to other professionals who've maybe done something similar and, and kind of gotten a, a you know, a pressure, blood pressure sort of from them to, to see if it, it's <laughs> worth trying? Yeah, I, I definitely was reaching out to some colleagues and asking them, hey, you know, how, how's the work for you, you know, knowing that you're not exclusive? Um, it, it was a little bit easier in that my daughters are mostly all grown up. I, I only have one, two more years worth of college tuition to pay, you know, and, and <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but it was, it was scary, right? It's, it's like you go from a, a guaranteed kind of gig to, all right, now you're going to have to go kind of sell yourself and, and, and let people know, all right, I'm open for business. <laughs> uh, so it was, a, it, it was, it was hard. Uh, I'll tell you the first time I uploaded work to the Marvel server was, was, uh, weird. <laughs> like I was cheating on somebody. <laughs> In the past, people would ask me, "You've worked for so long in the industry. Which characters would you love to work, you know, work on?" And, and it was always characters on the Marvel side because I just haven't worked on them before. And so uh, I'm, I, I'm getting it to... off that list now, thanks to, to to going freelance like this. And you've had the opportunity to work on um, the biggest characters in all of comics. You've worked on Superman, on Batman, and not just the, you know regular run-of-the-mill issues you worked on the big high-profile storylines um, so you know is there one story that stands out to you that you look back at and you just you're just absolutely dazzled by the work that you've done uh, maybe it wasn't that big a-list story that you know we're thinking of but it's just another one that you really felt that you you nailed I've been lucky to have worked with in so many I mean uh, everybody knows me for my work on Hush and it's still one of my favorites, and it's because of just it was the right everything at the right time for all of us, and and so definitely that one sticks out. As far as like a, a book that isn't on everybody's radar, that I'm very proud of the work that I did, Aerosmith with Kurt Busiek and Carlos Pacheco, Jesus Marino, was I still love what we did there. It, it allowed me to explore European palettes uh, from like European comics and European artists. I, I really kind of dove into a lot of their work and, and, and extracted what I felt was going to work for the story. So I really enjoyed the work that we did with that. Um, and then there's other projects like Blackest Night, which is probably the hardest job I've ever had to do. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, it, everybody welcomed it and loved it. And so it becomes this, this like, man, I don't know if I'd be able to do it all over again, but I'm glad I did because it taught me a lot, a lot about uh, 
about light and multiple light sources and, and and uh, I struggled at times, but in the end run, uh, I'm very proud of that work too. Well, Alex, they are telling me that we are just about out of time. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And I'd like to thank everyone at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.